A reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. Listen for a good word from the Lord. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say for yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. And soldiers also asked him, And what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, or be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. You know, sometimes snakes show up at church, literally. At least that's what happened two weeks ago. I got to our church campus at about 8 o'clock that Sunday morning. When I walked into the main entrance to the building off the parking lot, I turned on the lights in the atrium area just outside of the gym where our after-school program meets each day during the week. And I started to walk toward my office. When all of a sudden I noticed the thankful tree that was on the wall immediately to my right. It was a project that our after-school students had been working on throughout the entire month of November. It had a solid-looking brown trunk with almost bark-like texture made out of brown butcher paper. From the trunk sprouted several branches, and each branch was filled with leaves. And on each leaf was the name of someone or something the students were thankful for. And each was placed as an offering of thanks to God. It was beautiful. As I walked past the thankful tree, I noticed at the very bottom where the roots of the trunk seem to spill into the floor as if it's trying to find its way towards the soil. There was something there that was long and skinny right there on the floor. It was slightly brown in color and it almost blended in with the trunk's roots. And when I spotted it out of the corner of my eye, I first thought it was a toy of some kind. You see, Bridget, our minister to families, has these incredible worship boxes that are made for each family in the church and for any guest with children. And each has different activities and items to keep the children engaged during worship each week. Now, one of the items is a long, skinny, stretchy, rubbery toy. It's almost serpentine in nature. And I thought it was one of those, honestly. But upon closer inspection, it was obvious that a snake, a real-life snake, had made its way into the church. So I took a quick picture for evidence, and because I knew it would become a sermon illustration at some point, I then found a broom and a dustpan, and I gently escorted my new friend back outside. I went to Google to confirm that it was only a harmless baby brown snake, which is non-venomous, of course, but I sent it to the rest of the team that is on campus each day because I figured that if there was a baby, then Mama might not be too far away, and who knows if he had friends somewhere. Well, thankfully, we haven't had any additional serpentine visitors since then. Now, I believe that everyone is welcome at church, but I draw a line there. I didn't sign up to be a snake handling Baptist. But I suppose this little critter was only doing what comes natural to it. It was a cold day outside. He needed shelter. And we've seen plenty of hawks in the neighborhood over the last several months. So you can imagine that this little guy would have made a nice snack for someone. And our thankful tree seemed like a pretty safe place to hide, I suppose. That's what baby snakes do. A brood of snakes stays together. They are safe in number. They're comfortable in their nest. Mom is there to protect them. 
That is until something changes. And as soon as something changes, they scatter. They slither in all directions until they can find a safe place to hide. You brood of vipers, John the Baptist calls those who come to listen to him and who want to be baptized. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You scared little snake babies. What are you so afraid of? What are you running from? This is sort of part two of the lectionary focus of the prophetic message of John the Baptist. And to be fair to any sense of the fear the crowds might have felt, John was the one delivering what could easily be seen as a truly scary message. He came out of the wilderness. He was proclaiming that God was about to intervene in world history. And as a result, he was saying that everything was going to change. High places that stood in the way of God's will, like immovable mountains, were about to be torn down. Low places where people were kept in oppression and darkness, they were going to be filled in and lifted up. Rough places full of jagged edges, they were going to be smoothed out. And a new path was going to be paved to each individual heart. Now maybe he's surprised that they think somehow they can escape what is coming. It's a bit of tough love from the prophet. I mean, here we are gathered on the third Sunday of Advent with the sanctuary beautifully adorned with the signs of Advent everywhere. I mean, it's the Sunday of joy and everyone wants to feel warm and happy and all Christmassy. And then here comes John the Baptist, kicking the door open and pushing the trees over and throwing the wreaths on top of the Advent candles, engulfing everything in flames and warnings to repent and be baptized. He's scaring the pants off of everyone. He's taking everything they had invested themselves in, everything about their particular religious, cultural, and heritage that had made them think that they were immune to the wrath of God, and he's blowing it apart. I guess sometimes you need someone to tell you like it is, regardless of who you are. I've always been a fan of the show The West Wing. I've watched the entire series so many times that I've lost count. There's a poignant moment in the series when President Bartlett is wrestling with the stress of his office as well as the traumas of his past. And it gets to a point where he simply can't sleep. He gets bad enough that they call a therapist, someone who specializes in trauma therapy, to see if he can help. They talk for two hours straight. And toward the end of the conversation, the therapist is starting to pinpoint some of the president's deepest issues. He comes to a conclusion in the conversation and pretty abruptly says that their time is up. He stands up and starts to walk to the door. The president is surprised and he isn't at all satisfied. They've worked through a double session, but he wants to keep working and get it all done as quickly as possible. So he looks at the therapist and says, I hate to put it this way, but I'm me and you're you and we're done when I say we're done. The therapist shakes his head and says, no, I think you could use some assistance right now, sir. Use me, don't use me, but all I can offer you is this. I'll be the only person in the world besides your family who doesn't care that you're the president. Time's up. The message from John the Baptist certainly seemed to scare the crowds into the waters of the Jordan. Their security blanket seemed to have been ripped off he didn't care who their ancestor was. I suppose a message like this could be understandably perceived as bad news to them before it was heard as good. I mean, if everything you thought you could depend on was being torn down and burnt with cleansing fire, then you might be scared too. The message from John the Baptist certainly seemed to scare the crowds into the waters of the Jordan. Their security blanket seemed to have been ripped off. He didn't care who their ancestor was. And I suppose a message like this could be understandably perceived as bad news before it could be heard as good. If everything you thought you could depend upon was being torn down and burnt with cleansing fire, then you might be scared too. But for John the Baptist, this isn't just a warning. It is also an opportunity, an invitation from God. It is an opportunity to look at your life and evaluate it against the world that is to come and determine what changes need to be made. John recognizes that some of the people who have come out aren't there out of honest concern for doing God's will. Some of them came to mock and make fun of what he's saying and doing, like a viper latching onto whatever it bites and injecting as much poison as possible 
Their cynicism has the potential to inject poison into all that is going on around them. And yet John doesn't just speak judgment even to them. He somehow seems hopeful in this. He speaks hard truth that needs to be heard, but he speaks it in such a way that he seems to actually believe that change is possible. Otherwise, why would he waste his breath? He believes they can change. They can repent. They can choose a different way. I said last week that if Advent is about preparing for the arrival of Jesus, then just like we prepare our homes to receive a guest at Christmas, we also have to prepare our hearts. But the preparations aren't just about the decorations that need to be placed in their perfect position within the house so that it finally feels like Christmas. As you decorate, you also are to also start to notice those things that need to be fixed. The light bulb that needs to be replaced, the leaky faucet that needs to be tightened, the mark on the wall that needs to be scrubbed off. You see all of those parts of the house that need a good, deep cleaning too. And so it is when we prepare for Jesus in our hearts. As we consider what it means both now and in the future for Jesus to come to us, we need to imagine what our lives would be like after everything has finally changed. And all that is left are the things of God. What parts of our lives would need to be cleansed first? What parts would be burned away so that they no longer are plaguing us? What would be left? Would we even recognize ourselves? After all, this is about preparing for transformation. And perhaps that is why John's baptism is such a profound symbol. First, repentance suggests we embrace a new way of seeing reality. We choose to walk a different way, a way toward fullness in God. And then baptism, the symbol of what is possible when brokenness is named and confessed and forgiveness is given. You know, it's believed that when John the Baptist led people through the experience of the baptism for repentance, he led them through a sort of reenactment of the Israelites entering into the promised land. They moved from the wilderness through the Jordan River to the east into the promised land. And that was also the same direction that they moved each time they returned home after exile, too. It was a process and a symbol of recentering on God and recommitting life to God's purposes. But as we would tell anyone who was going through the baptism ritual, baptism is just a beginning step on a new part of the journey. Your life should start to look different as you step dripping wet out of the water. We say that the old self has died and you are walking in new life. So your life should be a reflection of what is to come, not a reminder of what used to be, not of the old world that is being cut down and torn up and burned away. So they asked John, what should we do? It isn't just repent. It isn't just be baptized. Live as chained people. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Live lives that show the world that there is a better way out there. And John gets prescriptive here, which I think is important. He talks to everyone, but also to specific groups of people. Your issues are not my issues, and my issues are not your issues. We each have our own unique brokenness and sinfulness and areas that need to be cleaned up to better reflect the ways of God. He says, share what you have with those who are less fortunate and do not have enough. Live generous lives. If you have more than you need, give it away to someone who doesn't have enough. Now that could apply to just about all of us. The reality is that while we may not be in the top 1% of the wealthiest people in our own country, just about all of us are among the wealthiest when compared to the entire population of the world. We could live with and on far less than we do if we really needed to. Our problem becomes when we forget the needs of others. We only focus on ourselves. I believe it was Mother Teresa who said that so many of the world's problems are rooted in the fact that we have forgotten that we belong to each other. That's the way God created us. That's the way God intended for us to live. We all thrive together when we learn to look out for each other. We are blessed, if you want to use that language, to be a blessing to others around us. So live generously, John says, because God has been generous to you. Generously caring for the needs of others is bearing fruit of repentance. So start there. Then he spoke to the tax collectors. 
He knew that it was common practice for them to charge more than was necessary, more than was charged by the Roman government. That was how they lined their own pockets. They could gouge people for as much as they wanted, and because they had to pay Rome, there wasn't much of anything that the people could do about it as long as Rome got their cut. So John told them to stop it. Stop the extortion. Stop taking advantage of these poor people around you. And he said the same thing to the soldiers, who could basically bully people into giving them whatever they wanted. If they were soldiers, no one was going to stop them. To assault or kill a soldier would lead to your own demise. But what might happen if just one soldier or one tax collector stopped asking that way? Interestingly, John doesn't tell them to leave the tax collecting profession or to leave the army altogether. He just tells them that they should operate ethically in their own profession, their vocation. In other words, change the profession from within. After all, if you suddenly are the one tax collector that refuses to operate in unjust ways, or if you're the one soldier that refuses to participate in such bullying practices, then everyone's going to notice. The people will start coming to you to pay their taxes, knowing you aren't going to gouge them. They'll recognize that you aren't like the other soldiers. You've got integrity, and they will trust you more. Then, when they ask you why you are doing things differently, you can tell them it is because you are living out your faith in God. You are bearing the fruit of repentance. The other tax collectors and soldiers are going to take notice as well, though. You aren't going to make friends with them. In fact, you may face rejection, but that may just be part of it. John the Baptist was imprisoned by Herod and beheaded. Jesus' own synagogue wanted to throw him off a cliff, and he was eventually crucified. It isn't easy to change systems of oppression, but that is what we're called to do. Each day at home, at work, at school, and in the marketplace, instead of blindly going along with things as they are, we are meant to live so that our lives point others to a different way, a better way. Live generous lives. Give with freedom to others in need. Treat others fairly in a world that wants you to step on and over anyone who is in your way. Take notice of anyone in need and care for them as a reflection of God's way in the world. Learn to live with contentment and gratitude in God's realm and point people toward the justice of God who is breaking into the world and changing everything. This past Thanksgiving, my in-laws gave all three of their daughters a Christmas cacti. Each was a portion of a plant that had belonged to their grandmother. Interestingly, we had just been talking about Christmas cacti in our Wednesday afternoon Bible study not too long before that. Now, before that conversation, I had no idea that one of the healthiest ways to get the cactus to bloom is to move it into a cold, dark place and then bring it into the warmth and light so that it shocks the system of the plant. And suddenly, it will start to bloom. Sometimes our personal spiritual systems need to be shocked. Sometimes the systems out in the world need to be shocked as well. For us, especially as we prepare to welcome Christ at Christmas, we need the shock of the hard look at our lives to see where we need to cleanse and repent. And sometimes we need to be the shock given to the world system as well. We need to bear fruit of repentance. It may be hard to hear out of the mouth of someone like John, but remember, it is as much an opportunity as it is a warning. It is from someone who believes in us and believes that change is possible. And God will be with us as we do. Amen.